And I think in the end, I mean, it's, and Andre kind of alluded to this, we, I certainly never, when I ran for mayor, well, the truth be known, when I ran for mayor, I wasn't even sure exactly what a mayor did. I'm, I'm still not sure exactly what a mayor does. But it was, it was a, a notion that there could be, it seemed like there could be an awful lot of common sense ideas brought to, to local government. And what I've seen in the six years in office is there is a, a hunger within the bureaucracy, if you, if you give them authority and give them the support, that they will move towards efficiency with just a little bit of prodding. Not everyone, and there's certain places, you know, certain agencies that have always controlled their technology and they're very reluctant. You know, they feel their needs are different and they've always been able, when they want to change a priority, they can snap their finger and, and the priority changes. Uh, ultimately, I think we are proving to them, agency by agency, that in almost every case, they will get better service and get better support and better product uh, by having it centralized. Now, comparing Denver to other cities, one of the things that we really harped on during the convention was this fact that we were moving towards good government, right? This notion of shared services in every agency, which to my knowledge, no city has, has successfully done all the way through and give us about 18 months and we'll have, I think we'll be done it. We'll have done the entire process in, in our local government. That sense of innovation was what we put on, on you know, broadcast to, to all these media. We had almost 15,000 journalists here for the convention. So that's what we broadcast throughout the media was, this is a place where people come together, they collaborate, and they deliver, you know, on ideas that solve problems rather than create more problems. And, you know, people always talk about, you know, Darwinian selection and evolution and how, you, you know, competition, our competitive instinct is always favored in evolution. That's why, you know, if, 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 you, when, when we were hunters and gatherers, those who were more competitive could get more food for their families and their families would therefore be bigger and stronger and have healthier children and would be more likely to survive and, and their genetic strain, that competitive strain, would be favored. Well, you know what's really favored is our collaborative strain. And I've never seen that written. I'm sure someone's written about it, but if you actually step back and look at it, we, we were the greatest group hunters in, in evolutionary history. We put, the, we put the, the hyena to shame in terms of our ability to collaborate and work together. And that, that favorability of collaboration, we don't talk about it, and yet that's really what made the West open up, right? This was an inhospitable terrain, and what really opened the West wasn't the frontiersman or the trapper, it was the wagon train, where everyone came out, everyone had a role, the, 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 the team was all important, and by working together, they could survive in these very difficult elements. Those are the kinds of ideas we put on display at the convention, and I think we were so successful, I mean, more than most people imagine, if you look down the list of some of the, uh, of the notoriety we've gotten over the last six or eight months, let's say just in this year, <coughs> Uh, the Pew Research Center poll listed us as the most desirable place to live in the country. Market Watch called us the third best location for business in a metro area. Uh, CNN Money had a, uh, uh, an expert on there that said we were the top place to live and launch a business. Um, on the Today Show, they had a real estate expert that said we were the number one market poised for a real estate rebound. Uh, we were one of only two cities to see an increase in real estate sales in the first quarter of 2009. All these things certainly imply to us that A, our economy wasn't as badly hit as the rest of the country, and B, that the rest of the country noticed our, our successful innovations and you know, that we do things in a different place. It's not just about the 300 days of sunshine or the 850 miles of bike path or you know, the proximity to the Colorado Rockies. Now, a lot of that innovation, Green Print Denver, we've spent a lot of time, again, without going out and trying to spend a bunch of money but just finding simpler ways and more efficient ways to deliver, you know, to save energy, to build our buildings with better insulation. But if you go down the list, we've now planted over 150,000 trees towards our goal of planting a million trees in 20 years. I think we're going to get to that goal somewhere in probably 15 years. And especially we're beginning to get trees planted in low-income neighborhoods. So that, the, you know, again, the, one of the biggest, to me, one of the starkest differences between a low-income neighborhood and an affluent, a more affluent or middle-class neighborhood is trees. You go into low-income neighborhoods and you just don't see them. The people get into their cars and the moment they turn the car on, they need to turn on the air conditioning, which reduces their energy efficiency by literally 8 to 18 percent, depending on the, the, the make and the age of the vehicle. Uh, these trees are going to have play a huge role, not just in how beautiful our neighborhoods look, but also in, in energy. We've increased recycling by 63 percent. Uh, we now, every city building is that we, that we renovate or build is LEED certified. Uh, we have the uh, 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 water conservation, we have now since 2000 
cut per capita water consumption by roughly 18 percent. Our goal is to hit 20 percent. Now, of course, we've had a wet summer. But even if you take this wet summer out, we've cut water consumption by about 15 or 16 percent, and our goal is to cut it by 22 percent by 2015. We're going to make that. And again, for any metropolitan area, that is a remarkable achievement. <laughs> we had a neighborhood blitz where we had people go door to door into low-income neighborhood homes and do an energy audit and basically use some federal money to to those play, the low-hanging fruit, the really easy things to administer, wrapping a hot water heater, insulating around windows and doors, but the things that pay out in less than a year, we went out and helped those neighborhoods, the, 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 the families, save money, because almost every family pays their utilities. We know that if we can get an extra $20 or $40 a month into the household budget of a low-income family, the dropout rates at school go down, uh, domestic violence goes down. I mean, there, there's a critical place there where just a little bit of money makes things go better. And one great way to do that is to, is to insulate their homes and make sure that we, we get that done. We've now done that in three different neighborhoods. I think over the course of the next six and a half, seven years, we'll be able to work our way through almost all the 95% uh, of the low-income neighborhoods in, uh, uh, in the city. Uh, we just recently, two days ago, were uh, awarded $6 million from the uh, ARR, the American Recovery and uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, ARA funds, the stimulus funds, uh, towards energy efficiency and conservation block grants, which again will go to accelerate that work. Uh, and then last, the, the B-cycle, the bike sharing that we did in the convention, which was hugely successful. We had 1,000 bikes. They were used 6,500 times and ridden 26,500 miles. So we had a little left, leftover money after the convention, and part of that we put towards rolling out next summer a, uh, a, a bike sharing program. We'll start out with 600 bikes. Hopefully by the end of, of the first year we'll have 1,000 bikes so that when you get on or off a bus, where, where your place of business you want to, you don't always have to get in your car. You'll be able to get onto a bike. Um, we also have a, uh, four to five megawatts of solar power on Denver Public School facilities. Um, you know, a variety of other, we have a, a solar array at the airport on top of the convention center, uh, even on top of our Museum of Nature and Science. Uh, I think Ultimately, we are showing that we are able to lead both as a city and as a state in, in a lot of these green technologies, these green jobs, and we're getting a lot of calls of companies that want to move their uh, European companies that want to have their North American headquarters here. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll take a few questions, is after the DNC, and we saw what that can do, um, and we've been working for a couple years before that, so it worked out perfectly, but we wanted to have a signature, a legacy cultural event. It would help define our city's image in, to the rest of the world. And one thing that had struck me again and again was the, the perception of so many people of the problems with immigration. And clearly, we have an immigration system that doesn't work. But there's a bias against all immigration that I think is very poorly founded for our future. right? And that we have seen so many, a, a great number of, of immigrants, especially from Mexico and Central and South America, who came from rural areas, were not educated, they do either cleaning or, or, or some sort of manual labor, and that has agitated and created a backlash among a great number of people. There are biased against, there's a bias against people even with just with a Spanish accent, and, and I, I'm sure we all see it frequently. We looked at that aspect and then juxtaposed it with the notion that, that this country has constantly always been looking to Europe or to India and China more recently uh, for direction and for you know where is our, our opportunity. And we do not recognize the incredible potential that we have in our hemisphere. And uh, the fact that we import more oil from Latin America than we do from the Middle East. We have more trade and a faster growing rate of trade, of, of growth, from the hemisphere than we do with China. Right? People aren't aware of that. So, our way, our simple one-step solution to address this is to create a series of biennials. Every two years, we're going to create a world's fair of art and ideas based on the hemisphere. And we're going to call this the Biennial of the Americas. And next summer will be the first biennial. We've been working on a couple of years. The Betcher Foundation very generously gave us a $2 million grant to make sure we could get it off and running. But we will bring 
the, the thought leaders, the most creative people, the, from, not just from universities or, or academics, but from uh, CEOs from business and government leaders from South America, Central America, the United States, and Canada, from the tip of Tierra del Fuego all the way to the Hudson Bay, and for seven weeks bring them to Denver. And we'll have each week.